It's the Growing in Grace Together podcast. My name is Joel Brzezinski, and again, as I mentioned last time, this is something that I used to do, quite, well, not quite a bit, but I used to have um, several guests on from time to time. On uh, And so it was kind of a, this is a supplement to the Growing in Grace podcast, and this time is part two of a conversation that I'm having with Mike Adams from the Unsunday Show podcast and blog. So, Mike, uh, once again, welcome, and thank you for being here with me again. Thank you, Joel. It's always a pleasure to be able to talk to you, and I really appreciate this time. Yes, and I was talking with you in between our um, our our two uh, podcasts here, our two um, episodes, whatever you want to call it, just my appreciation for you and the... Uh, as I said last time, I really like the way that you express things, the way that you word things, the way that the things that you talk about having to do with the, the state of the church today, having to do with church history, having to do with how all of these things have, you know, church tradition has come about that really has nothing to do with what's in what's in the scriptures. And this is information uh, that I want to introduce to people who don't already know all of this. And I have learned so much from listening to the Unsunday Show podcast. I mean, previously, you and your wife, Susan, had the Grace Cafe podcast, and you shared your journey, and you shared uh, various aspects of, of grace and of uh, the Old and New Covenants and, and things like that. And the Unsunday Show podcast, for a while, you were running them simultaneously, doing both, and now it's uh, the Unsunday Show podcast and I'm every time I listen I learn something new and it's it's freeing uh, because I I think about so many of the things that you talk about I think about the stuff a lot but I I don't have the way to express it in the way that you do and so I'm very thankful and so I do hope that people will tune in to the unsunday show podcast at unsunday.com and uh, read your blog over there as well so Again, thanks for being here with me, and we'll continue talking about some of the things we were talking about last week, and uh, maybe talk about a few more things too. What's sounds good to me? Which way do you want to go? We we talked about um, bringing in the old and new covenants. So I don't, I don't know if you've um, have anything more to say about like church traditions and the you know the pastor and the way that church is, or if you have a, a different direction you'd like to go. Well, let's talk a minute about old covenant, new covenant. Does that sound good? Sure. Um, one thing that you said last time, you mentioned the altar. There's really no such thing. The altar was, is an old covenant thing. It was brought right. into the church. I'm thinking about how in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 23, Jesus said, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, um, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way, and, and all of that. And so people have considered this, to, when, if people who consider the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, to be a Christian teaching, that fits in to their thinking because the church has an altar. You go to a church, they got an altar up there, and it just fits into their thinking. But R Jesus was actually talking about the altar where they would bring their sacrifices the animal sacrifices, and That's that right. was certainly not brought into the church. And we've Christianized that. We, we've Christianized what Jesus said when he was really talking to Jews who were under the Old Covenant, and he was talking Old Covenant talk. And so sometimes a lot of what gets brought into the modern-day traditional church setting is stuff that really has nothing to do with life in Christ at all. Um We'll see what, what what kind of thoughts you have on that. I like that word Christianize, because that's what we do. We take what's in our environments around us, our church environments, our religious environments, and we read them back in the Scripture, don't we? Mm -hmm. We take what we know, and we say, this must be this. And as we're reading a passage of Scripture, like the altar you know, you just mentioned, we read back into scripture our altars. <laughs> yeah. And we think we think, yes, this is this is true, you know, preach it Jesus, you know, kind of thing. But like you said, our altars don't have blood on them. Our right. altars don't have burnt offerings. 
That's the altar Jesus was referring to. Sacrifices were made on that altar. And it's an old covenant concept. And like we talked about last time, that's one of the things that Cyprius of Carthage grabbed from the old covenant, brought over into the new and said, we need altars. And it stuck. Hmm. It stuck. It's still with us. But it's that whole idea, not only bringing things over that don't belong, but the law, hmm. the law itself, which the new covenant scriptures in first and second Corinthians three label as a ministry of death. You know, we, you and I as Gentiles, as non-Jews have never been under the law. Actually, nobody alive today has ever been under the law because the old covenant was replaced by the new covenant at the cross when Jesus died and the law was abolished. The law went away. So nobody today is under the law, but yet we have such a romantic flirtation with it within Christianity, within institutional Christianity, because institutional Christianity has to keep people dependent on it. It has to keep people on the hook, on the line. And you can't do that by proclaiming grace alone. You have to have law. You have to have a hook. You have to have something that says you're not doing it right. You're not doing enough. And so here's the Ten Commandments. You need to be doing these, or the nine or the eight, whatever you pick. Or here's the Sermon on the Mount. You need to be more like this. Here's your goal. Well, the goal of the Sermon on the Mount in the last verse of chapter five of Matthew is be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Right. And, you know, good luck with that. But that idea of being perfect as your father in heaven is perfect meets its fulfillment with Jesus at the cross when he said it is finished. Because by one sacrifice, the writer of Hebrews tells us, we've been made perfect forever. And so the perfection comes from outside of us. Well, you and I talked before we recorded part one, and I mentioned how that when we don't distinguish between Old Covenant and New Covenant, it flattens out all of Scripture. So that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the New Testament, or the New Covenant, aren't really different from one another. When we think that, or excuse me, when we don't interpret Scripture according to the covenant that it was written in and written to, then it flattens out the Bible, and I start to think that all of it applies to me. Mm-hmm. And so if someone gets a tattoo, they're condemned, you know, because Leviticus, they don't get a tattoo. Right. But these were laws given to the ancient nation of Israel at that time. And even at the time that Paul wrote, him, you know, being a former Jew, the Apostle Paul, even at the time that he wrote, he's saying things like the law has been abolished. That by the cross, by the death of Christ, the law has been abolished. It's been done away with. He, it's been nailed to the cross. And the Gentiles of Paul's day, and even before that, have never been under the law. The law was given to the nation of Israel only. That's it. And it was only given for a period of time. Galatians right. 3 and 4 brings that up very clear. That the law was only in place until Jesus came. Until faith came. It's not talking about personal faith. It's talking about the new covenant. And the law was historically time-bound to that time era, and yet we have such a romantic flirtation with the law. And this comes to us by church history. And we don't know how to shake it or something. We, we don't know. Maybe we just don't question it. You know, I, I don't know what the answer is. But when you read church history, it's very clear how fast the body of Christ, not as a whole, but those within its leadership, began to move away from the new covenant, gospel of grace, and began to mix it with the old covenant law, which is a ministry of death. It happened very quickly. Right. And we're still in it. It's still with us. This... Stuff that goes on around us, you know, if you, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, but many did. And so 
they're used to this system. They're used to seeing this stuff all the time, and we don't question it. We don't question it because, well, it must be right, because that's what the church says is right, or that's what the pastor says is right. And we don't question it. But the system that we have in place does so much harm, I believe, to the functioning of the body of Christ and the functioning of spiritual gifts by everyone in the body of Christ that it needs to be talked about. You know what? On my podcast, on my webpage at unsunday.com, on the about page and on the intro page, I say something like, I ask honest questions about the traditions that go on within religious organizations in order to find answers. I hope I'm not toxic. I don't want to be toxic. That's not my point. But I do want to ask honest questions about this stuff. And so that's kind of what I do. That's kind of my thing. You know, Hmm. where did these traditions come from? Why are they so harmful? We talked last time about the difference between ecclesia and the word church and how that the word church is splattered all over the New Testament where ecclesia is. One example of that is in Matthew 18. And I'm still working through this. I don't have answers to this just yet. But I think I'm getting close. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, in Matthew 18, for anyone you know not familiar with that, it's commonly thought to be a passage about church discipline. That's what we call it. You know, if someone sins against you, go to him alone. If he hears you, you warn your brother. If he doesn't hear you, take two or three witnesses. And, you know, then if, then if he doesn't hear you, take it to the ecclesia. The word church isn't there. Right. It's the word ecclesia. But by putting the word church there, we brought it into the new covenant. And we said, this is something we need to be doing. But it's absent in the new covenant scriptures. Even though there was ample opportunity to do what Jesus said, it never was alluded to. It never was brought up. It never was talked about. It never was done. You think about the guy in Corinth who had a relationship with his stepmom that Paul ended up saying, get that guy out of the assembly. He's hurting people. He didn't follow the pattern of Matthew 18. He didn't even bring it up. Because I don't think that Matthew 18 is a new covenant idea. I think it's an old covenant idea. But again, I'm not completely, I haven't completely worked through the whole thing yet. So when I do, I'll do a, another podcast about it and a blog post on it. So, so but, if you're in, in, in your current understanding then, um, what would, and maybe this, maybe this part of what you haven't worked out yet, but where it does say, if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the ecclesia. And if he refuses to hear, uh, even to hear the ecclesia, um, so the word ecclesia would also have an old covenant context as well, or could be used. So it's not necessarily a Christian word, right? Right. It's something in the secular society of that day that was real common, because if Jesus was talking about the new covenant body of Christ in that passage, why didn't somebody raise their hand and say, what's that? Right. There you go. I like that. What are, what are you talking about, Jesus? What do you mean church? But that didn't happen because they had some kind of reference for ecclesia. And ecclesia, in the historical context, was really nothing more than like a town council. It was government. It was government on a local level. It was a town council. We see that in, what is it, Acts 19 or Acts 17? I think it's 19. When, uh, you know, Paul and his group are in the city and they're causing such a riot Things are really happening, and there's a riot starting. It says that they call the assembly, they call the ecclesia. It was a it was a town meeting of the town officials. And so when Jesus said, "I'm going to build my ecclesia," the apostles had some kind of reference to that. It wasn't real clear to them, obviously, but there was some kind of reference where they didn't have to ask him what he meant. Hmm. And when Jesus said, you know, Jesus uses terms in there in Matthew 18 that are very unique, that are very old covenant. He says that if he doesn't listen to you, take it to the ecclesia, in other words, take it to the town council and get it sorted out. And if he still doesn't listen, some of our translations say, let him be as an unbeliever, but that's not what it says. Right. It says, let him be as a Gentile. 
as a non-Jew. Oh, this has got a really thick Old Covenant Jewish flavor to it. And I'm not convinced it's church discipline. Right. I don't think that's what's in view there at all, because most of us are Gentiles. Right. And he's not saying let him be as an unbeliever. You know, most of Old Covenant Israel weren't believers. Right. They didn't enter the they didn't enter the promised land because of what? Unbelief. All right. Every yes. time every time the new covenant, the New Testament scriptures give us a analysis of old covenant Israel, it's always bad news. Yes. Because they were under a law covenant that they agreed to, but they broke. You know, that's even, you know, God found fault with the people and said, I'm gonna I'm gonna give a new a new covenant. It's not gonna be like the old covenant. Why did he find fault with the people? Because when he made a covenant with the people, the people said, yes, all that the Lord has said we're going to do. But they immediately broke it. And so God found fault with the people. And so every evaluation in the new covenant scriptures of old covenant Israel is one of unbelief. It's one of bad news at the very best. And this is no different. It doesn't say let him be as an unbeliever. It says treat him like a Gentile, not a part of the Jewish community. Yeah, so that's, that's very anyway. important for people to understand. That someone had recently sent me a, a PDF of a of an outline of a something a pastor had preached. They wanted me to um, to look over it and see what I thought, and so I just took a little bit of time with it. But that pastor on his outline said. He used the word Gentile, and he said, nowadays, the word Gentile means unbeliever. And, uh, and I'm thinking, no, that's not at all nope. what that word means. The, the I'm looking at the New King James, it says heathen, uh, but the, the word is the same. It's the word that is often translated as a Gentile, and that indeed, to the Jewish people who Jesus was talking to in Matthew 18, they understood it to be a, gent, a non-Jewish person. Like you said, the, uh, when when it came to Christ and his uh, crucifixion and death, burial, and resurrection, there were a lot of Jews who still did not believe in him, and there were, there were some who did. Uh, but the ones who did and who knew Jesus, if they would have heard these words that Jesus had said before the cross, they would have understood that Jesus was talking about Gentiles, non-Jews. Not um, he wasn't talking about unbelievers. That's yeah, important right. to understand. It is. It is. And also, would Jesus have been saying, "Well, if there's a conflict with you in the ecclesia, which is the church, which you don't understand yet, if there's a conflict there, wait a year and a half until I die, right, <laughs> and then take it to the church, right? No, no, that isn't what he said. You know, he's he's talking about immediate resolution." And again, Paul didn't Paul didn't pick up that banner with the guy in Corinth and say, "Well, let's follow Jesus' principles here, and let's do this," because right. I don't think it's for the New Covenant Assembly. You know, I, uh, so, something I hadn't thought about too much in all my years, but I've recently heard it a few different times where people have brought up that Jesus is very rarely quoted in the New Testament epistles. I think right. Paul, Paul quotes him just. I, I'm not sure the number is, but it's very little, because and and the re, one big reason for that is not a diss on Jesus. Um, he wasn't obviously Paul had high regard for Jesus, but it the, the very re, the the reason was because Jesus had this old covenant ministry. It wasn't a new covenant ministry. He came, he said, for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and. That was what a, a large part of that ministry was for, and it was ministering the law for a reason. The law had been given for a reason, but when the, he died and rose again from the dead and the new covenant came uh, into effect, uh, these words of his, we don't spit on them, we don't hate them, we're not against them, we just put them in the context in which he spoke them, and he was speaking to people who were who were under the old covenant, and it, it these words don't uh, translate into the new covenant and and Paul knew that Paul wouldn't have quoted anything that Jesus said if he was trying if Paul was trying to teach the new covenant he wouldn't have taught 
Jesus' old covenant words in order to make his new covenant points and help people to understand the new covenant. Now, Paul, of course, did talk a lot of old covenant talk, but that was to help people to understand the purpose of the law and the old covenant and why this new covenant was needed. Uh, so that was the that would be the only time when Paul would talk old covenant and law talk uh, was to help people to understand again why this this new covenant was needed and to distinguish the two from each other, which is again something that seems to be lost on on a lot of people in the church, and it does cause a lot of confusion and it causes a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of problems. So you know with 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 doctrine with new new covenant doctrine. Um, when we try to work um, the Old Covenant into the New Covenant, and the, the two are not alike in any way. God said that the New Covenant would not be like the Old. It's, it's not going to be like the Old in, in any way. It's something new and better, and uh, we, we sometimes think that the, uh, the New Covenant is just Old Covenant Part 2, or it's the a continuation of the Old Covenant. God started something in the Old, now he's continuing it with the New. But Hebrews makes it clear that the Old Covenant was made obsolete, and that means right. that it's gone, it's done, it's, it's not something that we use anymore. It's like an eight-track tape. You know, it's like <laughs> we don't, we, you can't take an eight-track tape and try to stick it into your uh, CD player, or nowadays your smartphone, because a lot of people don't even use CD players anymore. You say, here I'm talking about things that are obsolete, and sticking it into something that's <laughs> it's still, it's also not quite obsolete, but almost, because I haven't used a CD player in a long time. I know some people do, but it, it, all of our music now is digital uh, for the for the most part. And so, yeah. we're, but we're trying to take old things and fit them into the new when they were never meant to mix at all. And th- that caused a lot of problems. That's right. Just for the record, I do still have an old reel-to-reel tape deck from oh. the 1970s. So, <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I've got about uh, 25 or 30 reels, too. So those are my old-style, old-covenant playlists. Well, well, back in the 90s when Cap and I were in the uh, in the radio together, when I started there in 1994, we were playing music on record albums and CDs, and we had uh, we were running a lot of programs like half hour programs on cassette tapes so we would tr- switch and transition between those three things and also we had a thing called a cart that you would press a button and it would play <laughs> a track at a time so it was kind of like an eight track tape similar concept yeah. and <laughs> and then it, it was in the late 90s that uh, everything became digital everything was put onto uh, onto computers and that made things a lot easier, but yeah, you couldn't take, you couldn't do the records anymore, or the tapes, or the or anything else. And so, but yeah, we're trying to do that today with the old covenant, and you just can't do it. We are, and you know, one of the reasons I brought up Matthew eighteen and church discipline is because that idea appears in almost every formal church membership contract out there. <laughs> that if you don't fulfill the requirements that you're expected to fulfill in becoming a formal church member, the ultimate threat is church discipline. The ultimate threat is we're going to kick you out. When I'm not even sure that that's a new covenant idea. Right. So, yeah, where is church membership in in the scriptures? Yeah, Yeah, true. You know, things like church, I belong to this church, this this church that's on this block, you know, this particular one, this is the one I belong to. You know, when, when Paul, for example, was writing to the churches, the, to the church at Ephesus or, or whatever, he wasn't talking about a specific church building and, and the pastor at that church, but he was talking about the people who were in that city who were believers. It's, it's, I mean, if I could put it simply like that. He wasn't sure. like saying that this is... Uh, or like, And when he was trying to... Um, asking people to store up some gifts that he would bring, like to the, to the church at Jerusalem. I mean, it, it wasn't like, well, the first church of the whatever at Jerusalem. We're gonna. He, it wasn't anything like that. It was that the people there, the believers, were had some needs, and so let's uh, collect up some things so that we can bring them to them, the people in that city who have needs. Um, and today we've got. 
just all kinds of ways in which this is it's it's so messed up where we got again as we talked about last week the focus on a pastor and it's all and and the staff and everything goes through the pastor and the staff and nothing gets done the way that it was done in the actual new testament epistles or hardly anything yeah we've we've moved away from the simplicity that's in christ into a complex system it's mm-hmm. a system of conformity to the rules where you're expected to conform and the rules you know don't have anything to do with the new covenant gospel of grace that you know they there are rules that are in place to to keep again i don't remember if we said it last week or, or just now but rules that are in place to keep the institution viable because the institution has to survive. We've got bills to pay. We've got salaries to pay. We've got insurance. We've got utilities. We have to keep this thing going. And so the way that we do that is we reach back into the old covenant, take something out of context, and we give people to-do lists. I remember as a pastor always being told by other pastors Make sure that when you wrap up your sermon, you give some kind of practical application. In other words, that was code for make sure you tell people they need to do more. What to do. Yeah, here's what you yeah, need to do. Because, right, because they're not doing enough. And so put a burden on them to do more. We call it practical application. But, I mean, really, when you look at it, things like, what we call today spiritual disciplines, those don't exist in the right. New Covenant Scriptures. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with being disciplined, if that's what you want to do. But we take verses out of context to show that, yeah, we need to be practicing uh, spiritual disciplines. We even write books on it. You know, the art of spiritual discipline, or whatever the title might be. And we take verses out of context, like Paul saying, I die daily. Mm-hmm. We're saying, see, you need to put yourself to death. Daily. You need to die to yourself daily. Well, if I'm a new creation in Christ, why do I want to kill that? What's the point? And then when we're looking at context, when Paul said, I die daily, he was talking about literal physical death. Because he was being beat up on the road. He was being beat up by by the Jews who didn't like his message of grace. He was being threatened. That was his life. Right. And in that in that sense, he's dying daily. Right, or that's what he say, was talking about. A lot of persecution, a lot of problems from people. That's That was it. Yep. Right. Or we say you need to pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Life gets hard. Well, that's your cross to bear. And we spiritualize that and take it out of context, not realizing that that has nothing to do with anything. And we think that we elevate these spiritual disciplines, is what we call them, and we elevate them to the point where it's almost like we're supposed to get stronger and stronger somehow, independent of Jesus, independent of his grace, independent of him, and then that somehow pleases him. Oh, look at Mike over there. He's as strong as can be, you see. Instead of just resting in the finished work of Jesus, in the grace that I have, knowing that the Father loves me overwhelmingly, and that nothing can change that. And I'm free. I can just rest in his love. I can rest in that, knowing that regardless of what I do today, that doesn't change. Yeah, and I like, I, how you, I like how you, how you put that. I think you said something on the last one, and then this time about how the way that things are done. And, and this isn't, I've never really thought too much about this, but it makes perfect sense how, how you're saying it, that it, the way that things are taught and the way that things are run uh, these days, it's it's as if we are trying to become stronger. And I think what really stuck out was that we're doing this independent of Jesus. It's 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 like the what's taught and what the way it comes across is that no, this is you do this with Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. It's lip service might be given to that, but. The way that it's all presented is that you you've got to do this. It's up to you to do this. And again, the only if if I'm doing this in order to try to please God, 
if I am doing this on my own and if, and if he won't be pleased with me unless I do these things, that means that I'm doing it independently of him to try to please him. That that really sticks out to me. That makes a lot of sense that so much of these things that are done, whether it's bringing the old covenant in or whether it's making a lot of these um, New Testament, you know, things that Paul would say uh, when he was, a lot of times Paul was addressing problems that were going on in the church. And so he would say, here, here's how to handle this situation. And we make rules into those things. And when a pastor is preaching his sermon and he's trying to find a, a practical application, he's trying to find this week's message is going to be about this. He'll go looking for different scriptures that talk about what he wants to talk about. And he'll lay these things down as rules, as principles, as this is how you're going to do it. And you better do these things, uh, again, in order to get God to be pleased with you. But really, it's it's nothing more than us trying to be strong for God when he says to rest in him. And, and the fruit comes not by us trying to uh, work harder and to follow all these rules and principles, but the, it really comes through rest. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not the fruit of me Joel trying to do all these things for God. That that revolutionized my life when I when I heard that that it's because I was trying so hard and I was up and down and on a roller coaster ride. I was trying so hard to just everything that I heard on the on the radio from preachers and in church from from pastors. I was trying to do these things and Sunday morning that message would get preached and I would just be all fired up and here I go I'm going to take on the world and I'm going to take the world for Jesus and then you know Sunday night came along and we might have another fiery sermon and, but then by Monday morning it was all gone it was just yeah. it was the it wasn't there because what was missing was Jesus it was it was me trying to do these things for him as opposed to me walking in step with him and uh, and resting with him that's right that's exactly right. Because at the end of the day, you know, religious institutionalism is about a mixture. Well, it's it's works, number one. It's works. Mm -hmm. And it's all about perpetuating the religious institution. You know, we, we disguise it in things like we said, church, uh, spiritual disciplines, you know, get stronger and stronger independent of Jesus. We couch it in terms that sound noble. But at the end of the day, those terms are going to are going to kill you. They're going to cause you to crash and burn, just like I did. You know, mm -hmm. realizing, of course, some people thrive in that environment, and you know, good for them. Again, like I said last time, I would be the last one to tell you to leave if you're happy there. But there's many who want to leave, but maybe are afraid to. And there's something valid to that. You do lose friends. You do. You know, things do happen, and you have to kind of readjust. But the stuff that I do is is geared more toward that group that have either left or want to leave but don't know if they should. Mm -hmm. And so it gets back to being descriptive of my journey, not prescriptive, telling people what to do. Right, so, and that's good, I think, because so many people are in, are are – stuck. Uh, they don't know what to do. And your offer, what you have to offer is, hey, this is what happened with me. This is what I've gone through. This is how I'm seeing the scriptures these days, as opposed to how I used to see them. This is how I'm seeing the, the, the gathering of believers, the body of Christ. This is how I'm seeing the body of Christ these days, as opposed to how I used to see it. This is how I came to freedom. And I'm, I'm, offering my story. I mean, this is what I hear from you, that this is, you're, you're giving people your story and you're um, introducing people into how they can be free from that. And, and not, again, not telling people how they have to do it or what they have to do. And that's what I like about the Unsunday show podcast, Mike, that uh, you, you do share all these things in such a graceful way and in such a way that we'll reach these people. Because, uh, you know, there are people who, just aren't going to be reached and and it's same with our growing in grace podcast we get you know mostly positive feedback but we do get some opposition 
And sometimes we'll spend some time saying, hey, this is where we're coming from. But if it's someone who's really strongly opposed to what we're doing, it's just like, you know, we'll just agree to disagree with this and not make a big issue out of it. Because there are some people who will listen to what we have to say and listen to what you have to say, and they're just totally against it. And we just have to sometimes let those people be. But I, I like how you know who you're talking to and you know who you want to um, to bring in, introduce and bring into this life of freedom. Well, you know, people that aren't ready to hear this, I can't convince them. I don't want to convince them. That's, you know, that's the Holy Spirit's job. That's not mine. Mm-hmm. If the Holy Spirit's going to do that in their life, then he'll do it. He'll do it his way and on his timing. I'm just going to speak what I know and what, what's happened to me and what my thoughts are now as compared to when I was a pastor and in the depths of that system. That's all I'm doing. That's all I want to do. So I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. I just uh, am sharing what I, I, I love this message. I love the fact that I found Jesus outside of religion. Mm. I love the fact that Leaving religion drove me back to the gospel. I love the fact that leaving religion gave me clarity on the difference between the new covenant and the old covenant, and that the gospel of grace is housed in the new covenant. I love the clarity of being able to see that. I couldn't see that clearly before because I had to conform. Even as a pastor, I had to conform to the system. And I wasn't free to question beyond basic questioning if that makes sense <laughs> right I, I couldn't i couldn't go there without you know without getting a mark on my reputation or whatever but now now that i don't i'm not bound to that system any longer i'm free to ask these questions i'm free to ask honest questions and say well what about this what about this and what about this and i've i've discovered so much i mean we haven't even scraped the surface here in these two episodes I mean, I found so much. I found where sermons originated. And I, you know, I found where so much of the traditions that we have originated. And it's disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> it's disturbing that it was brought into the body of Christ and nobody's saying anything about it. Or very few people are. Especially the ones in charge. Right. I was taught some of I was taught some of this stuff in Bible school. But I didn't know at the time, I was pretty young, I didn't know at the time that, hey, maybe this is bad and I should address this. Because it was taught as normal. Because that's the way it's always been. Right. So don't rock the boat. So I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to, to bring up. I had a, a, one question with in regard to all this. Do you think that some of this stuff, and we had talked beforehand a little bit about this, but not much. Do you think that some of this uh, is due to, you know, pastors and leadership being, and, and the, the body of Christ in general being ignorant of the truth and or people in leadership wanting to and, and liking having the power and, and having control and have, being on top of the hierarchy um, that really is non-existent, but they, they like being there. Do you think it's a mix of some of this, or, or what do you, where, where do you think a lot of this comes from? Yeah, I think it's a both and. And when I think of ignorance, I don't mean that in a negative way. Right. I mean it as just not thought through, just not presented with the facts, not understanding the reality, not understanding the history of it, not understanding the origin of it. That's what I mean. So I think there's that, and then I think there is those in power that don't want to give up power, especially if you get a narcissistic person in there. You know, we look at qualifications to be a pastor, which as you said in that uh, very first episode, and I agree with it, that word pastor only appears one time in the New Testament, in Ephesians 4, with no description, no nothing. But we've taken that thing and we've institutionalized the heck out of it. We've, we've Christianized pastors, <laughs> if I can use that term. <laughs> And if you get a pastor who has narcissistic tendencies and isn't going to relinquish control and power, what do you do? I mean, we look at 
the qualifications for a pastor today are what degree do you have? Where did you get it? And do you agree with our tribal doctrine? Do you agree with our way of looking at the Bible? Those are the qualifications. Oh, one more. Are you a dynamic speaker that can draw people in no. and entertain people? Right. Those are the qualifications. Listen, anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. And if you get a person in there who has narcissistic tendencies, it can become abusive really quick. That's all I'm saying. I've seen it. I've been around it. I've witnessed it. It happens. And I hear about it all the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we hadn't elevated, if there was a way that we could just start over, if there was a way that we could just erase 2,000 plus years of church history Wipe and the just, start, clean. just start over with the Holy Spirit and, you know, with the New Testament, New Covenant scriptures that we have, I think things would be a lot different. Mm. But we can't do that because we're it's too ingrained in us. Again, church has trained the ecclesia out of us, and so we're too ingrained in it. I'm sorry, you were going to say something? Right. No, I just said yeah, if we could wipe the slate clean and just start fresh, yeah, that would that would be nice. I know it's like you're saying it's really ingrained in people, and I and so I think what's important about a conversation like this and about your your podcast and blog and and the things you talk about is it, you know one person at a time. I mean it's it's one heart at a time. Yeah, we're not gonna change the world. We're not gonna we're not gonna be able to wipe the slate clean and, and get the whole worldwide church, you know, to, to, to see things this way and to understand and, and to not be ignorant. And again, that that's not a bad word. It's not a, a thing that we're putting down people. It's just a lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. We're not going to be able to change everybody, but uh, I think one person at a time, one person listening to this, one person listening to your podcast, one person reading your blog, Maybe even leaving you a voicemail and you, giving them some good stuff. It's it's yeah, one person at a time, and that, that's what I like about the ministries that we have, that you have, that we have on our podcast. Is that even though we can't change the world, if one person gets free from anything that we say, that is one person who has become free. And that's good. You know, that's awesome. That's good. That's a great thing. Yeah. And and hopefully it's it's catching. You know, and that that person can help in in time free other people and and so on and so forth. So I, I think it's so so important what we're uh, what we're trying to do here in our podcasts and in spreading this gospel of grace and peace. I don't know if there's anything else you want to bring up. Um, I know we've both talked ourselves. Uh, Almost to death here with the <laughs> with two uh, <laughs> two episodes here longer than either one of us normally goes on our podcast, which is perfectly fine with me. Yeah, me too. I mean, this has been invigorating. It's been really encouraging, Joel, and I appreciate your time, man. It's just good to have conversations like this. Yes, I thrive. I thrive on this stuff. Yeah. Yep, I do too. I, and the the funny thing is, is that I've shared this before, and I'm not really a talker, but when it comes <laughs> to this, I, I mean, I am quite. I am quiet. I mean, I just don't say much. I think a, a lot, and I do talk. You know, I can get into a conversation, but I just don't say a whole lot. But when it comes to this, I could go on and on and on and on, really, until my voice dies out. <laughs> but that's exactly how I'm wired, Joel. I, I'm right there with you, buddy. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mike, for being on here with me on growing in grace together. I have definitely thoroughly enjoyed this and uh, one more time as we wrap up if you want to uh, let people know how they can find out more about you uh, your website and and uh, things like that um, let people know about that sure i'm at unsunday.com and the name of the podcast is the unsunday show and it's available on any podcast app and there's links at unsunday.com to all of those things so come and hop on board and let me know your thoughts, and you can leave me a voicemail there. You can rate my podcast and my uh, website there while you're there. If you want to, leave a review and a rating, and uh, interact. So, Joel, I appreciate this, buddy. Yeah, I really do. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I think this will reach and touch a lot of people. Uh, and 
free a lot of people up. So thanks again for your time, and I'll be uh, listening to the Unsunday show. And thanks again, Mike. You take care. Thanks, Joel. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye.